From A and D, this is Biography. For years, the Everly Brothers made perfect harmony. They merged country and pop to create a sound all their own, earning them a place in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Don and Phil Everly had a string of number one hits and recorded songs that became pop classics. They also began to detest one another. Theirs was a family feud for the ages, until they put on a legendary concert ending their estrangement live on stage. As they put it, we just got sick of each other. The Everleys are now in their early 60s doing what they did best back in the 50s, making beautiful music together. Don and Phil Everly's harmonies have been described as heavenly and revolutionary. Their unique blend of old Kentucky country and a new rocking rhythm and blues thrust them onto the front lines of the music world. They filled a void. Different arrangements, the Nashville sound combined with uh, Bo Diddley beats. Barely out of high school, they were declared the number one group in the world. But for these Kentucky brothers, the pressures of fame had dire consequences. Failed marriages, bitter business battles, and drugs threatened their careers and their lives. Phil got a call one afternoon or one evening that his brother was taken to the hospital. Don and Phil Everly are and always have been two essentially different personalities. At the low point of their career, their differences wrenched them apart for 10 years. In time, they learned to agree to disagree. We aren't hip locked by any stretch of it and we we are different people and uh, like different things. We when we get together we sing and that's what we do when we work out there you know we don't go on vacation together. <laughs> There are two legacies that run deep through Muhlenberg County, Kentucky, coal mining and music making. Don and Phil Everly were born into both. Their father, Ike Everly, came from a long line of Kentucky coal miners, as did their mother, Margaret. By the time Don was born in 1937, Ike's musical talents led him out of the mines and into performing for a living. By 1939, when Phil was born, the Everly family had moved north to Chicago, where Ike played in small, smoky bars. Dad played at a place called the Kit Kat Club, with pool tables and a bandstand and everything. And he played down there, and I remember the, the smell of the place and the look of the place. Chicago provided Ike with full-time work and gave Don and Phil an introduction to music, ranging from Italian opera to blues. The big city was exciting, but Ike and Margaret wanted to raise their boys in a small town. In the fall of 1944, the family moved to Iowa, eventually settling in the town of Shenandoah. I mostly remember the winters, you know, which is where you, we'd just get up and it'd be really, really cold. You'd stand over, we used to have a floor heater and we'd stand over that until while dad warmed up the car and, he'd, and it was that kind of thing, you know, zero degrees. From childhood, the boys were very different. Don was more introspective and showed an early interest in cooking, painting, and photography. Phil was more outgoing and athletic, competing in track and basketball at school. What they both shared was their parents' love of music. My father taught me how to play the guitar and sing, and I, when I discovered Hank Williams, I, was, I wanted to be a songwriter, be on the Grand Ole Opry like Hank Williams. When the boys were six and eight, they began making occasional appearances with their father on his local radio show. Where is Donnie Everly? Great big fella. You hear this young man on the air quite a bit. Good morning, Donnie. Well, good morning. Here good morning. is uh, Philip Everly now. Philip, how old are you? Seven years old. You're seven years old, uh-huh. And he's got a very fine song for you. It's Silent Night. Silent Night. Oh. 
Phil had a higher voice than his brother, so he sang harmony while Don sang lead. The boys practiced together every day. Shenandoah was a safe and friendly town, and in time it felt like home. Every summer the family returned to their first home, Kentucky, where they visited relatives and friends and got reacquainted with their roots. There's not a lot to do in Muhlenberg County, and uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's a very small town, a mining camp, and so we got together, uh, uh, we played and sang, uh, seemed like night and day. As the boys' appearances on the radio increased, so did their fan mail. Ike showed the mail to his producer and convinced him to sign his sons and their mother as regulars on the show. In 1950, the Everly Family Show debuted. Philip was real young. He'd tell jokes. Don was called Little Donnie. He'd sing solos. By the time Don was 14 and Phil 12, singing and playing on live radio was as much a part of their routine as was school. We usually got laid off or fired in the spring because farmers weren't uh, listening to the radio early in the morning. They were, uh, you know, out working the fields, so there wasn't a market. And we usually would travel uh, around the country and audition at uh, wherever we saw a radio tower and we'd pull in, put on these uh, cowboy suits that we were continually outgrowing. As live radio began being replaced by records, work became harder to find. The already poor family was in trouble. In 1953, the Everleys moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, hoping to find work in the big city. Soon after their arrival, the family was signed to a country and western radio station. When they weren't performing, Phil and Don attended high school, where their hairstyle, clothing, and music made them stick out like two sore thumbs. They found acceptance and excitement within Knoxville's diverse musical culture. The city vibrated with bluegrass, country, jazz, and rhythm and blues. Elvis Presley and Bill Haley in the Comets were being played on country radio. Don was especially impressed with Bo Diddley. The boys began experimenting with their music and writing their own songs, getting a rise out of their younger audiences, but a cooler reception from others, including their boss. Our hair was a little longer than... I mean, we didn't sound quite as southern as he wanted, and so he called us Yankees, and <laughs> we weren't country enough, so we lost that job. I think it was due to Phil and I's parents and stuff. Just one year after they'd been hired, the Everly family was out of work. This time, the family couldn't find another gig. They moved into a smaller apartment, and Ike and Margaret could only find low-paying jobs. It was a difficult and frightening time. The one bright moment came when Chet Atkins performed in Knoxville. He had learned of Ike through the strong Kentucky music grapevine, and the two had corresponded a bit. When Chet came to town, Ike took his sons to meet him. So I met the Everly brothers at a fair in Knoxville. Their father brought them and uh, introduced me to them. And I can still see them looking up at me through the fence. And uh, Don and Phil, I think they were probably 14 and 16, or 15 and 17. And uh, he said, they're writing some good songs, too. And I said, well, send me some songs down to Nashville to come down. And Chet Atkins, bless his heart, came to Knoxville, Tennessee, and gave us his home phone number which was like a treasure, was the key to the city here. Phil and Don went to Nashville and auditioned their original material for Chet. He was very supportive and advised them to rework a couple of tunes, particularly one song of Don's. I was shocked that he liked it, you know. So I took it home and come back the next day and he liked what I had done with it. You know, a few months later, I got a letter from him said that Kitty Wells had recorded it and I was just flabbergasted. Don's amazement turned into disbelief when Kitty Wells scored a hit with his composition, Thou Shalt Not Steal. The first royalty check was close to $600, more money than the Everly family had seen in some time. After paying a few essential bills, the family decided that the rest of the money would be used to move to Nashville. In the summer of 1955, Phil, Don, and their mother arrived in Nashville. Once again, Chet Atkins helped the boys out introducing them around town. That and Don's one big hit landed the brothers a recording contract with Columbia. On November 9th, Phil and Don entered a recording studio, overjoyed to cut their first record. 
their excitement quickly vanished when they were rushed through the session. We were in and out of there in 20 minutes, which is, we cut four sides in 20 minutes. And I remember talking with Donald afterwards and looking at him, and, and the, I knew the second two was kind of, I was really bad. And I, and I said, well, maybe the people think it's a new sound or something, you know. But they didn't, and the songs died a quick death. Even with Chet's help, the brothers faced rejection after rejection. Their parents moved to Indiana to pursue jobs, while the boys stayed in Nashville to pursue their dream. Ike and Margaret sent what money they could, but things continued to get bleaker. We were out of money, and we got down to, all we had was a, a stick of butter and a, a box of cornmeal. And um, Donald uh, made those, made eight muffins from that cornmeal, and we had put that butter on it. And I've never had anything that good. You know, because we hadn't eaten for a day or so. Like other aspiring musicians, the boys spent many nights in the alley behind the Ryman Auditorium, where the Grand Ole Opry was staged. With guitars in hand, they hoped to get noticed and audition on the spot. Don did get noticed one night by a young secretary named Sue Ingram. They began dating and shortly after got married in November 1956. Her meager wages, along with their parents' contribution, weren't enough to pay the bills. Reluctantly, they decided to head up to Chicago to join their parents who had moved there. After a promising start, Nashville had flatly rejected the Everleys. The winter of 1957 was a particularly bitter one for Don and Phil Everly. After 18 months of hardship and rejection, they made plans to join their parents in Chicago. As they packed up their things, they got a call from a friend who had put in a good word for them with Wesley Rose, the head of Acuff Rose, the largest music publisher in Nashville. Rose invited the boys to stop by and audition. He was impressed with what he heard and introduced them to Archie Blyer, the head of Cadence Records in New York. Blyer had turned down a tape the Everleys had sent him just six months earlier. This time, on Rose's advice, he signed them to a three-year contract. I was still working the Opry and down in the alley one night, I'll never forget it. Uh, Don said, hey, we got a new court recording deal with Cadence Records. Archie Blyer said, uh, would you join me? We'll play some Bo Diddley. And I said, yeah, man, just call me and we'll do it. On March 4th, Don and Phil, Chet Atkins, Archie Blyer, and one of Wesley Rose's top writers, Budlow Bryant, entered a recording studio. Among the songs the group considered was one Budlow and his wife Felice had written. He had five acts there that day, and the first four acts turned down a song called Bye Bye Love. It wasn't strong enough. Bye bye love, bye bye happiness, hello loneliness, well I think I'm a gonna cry. Budlow and uh, Archie sang the song. And so well, can you do anything? So we said, yeah, of course we could. We knew what we could do. We knew we could sing a better than they I mean, we could give it a... And I had a song called Give Me a Future. And uh, I was thinking about that yesterday. The, the arrangement was... Dun, da, 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 dun, 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 dun. The same arrangement that Bye Bye Love is was on this song called Give Me a Future. And Archie said, well, Don said, well, that's really good. So why don't you take that and just... You know, and I said, oh, okay. Donald slapped that on the front of that Bye Bye Love thing, and Archie said, that's swell. <laughs> and so then the we was going to record us, and we said that's swell too, because that got sixty-four dollars, and I knew we were going to get sixty-four dollars a piece to go down and record. And that's all I thought about. I didn't think about well, it might get a hit record. The brothers felt good about the session, but there were no guarantees. They did have one hundred twenty-eight dollars in their pockets, and were about to add to that. A buddy of mine, whose father was a promoter, got us a job um, in a tent show, and that paid ninety dollars a week. And that, so, you know, we didn't have to go north <laughs> and get jobs with jackhammers. That job and the buzz that was beginning over their record landed the boys another tour. This one headlined by Brenda Lee and George Jones. While on the road, they heard that a big Nashville star named Webb Pierce had recorded "Bye Bye Love." They returned to Nashville expecting to hear Webb's version of their song on the radio. To their astonishment, their version was at the top of the country charts. There 
goes my baby with someone new. She's sort of happy out there and blue. She was my baby. She said then goodbye to the man that I might have been. It was a great sound that I hadn't heard before, you know. It was country and it was rock and roll. Seeing the Everly Brothers, I mean, I never saw two humans that looked like that. They don't have people like that in New York, you know. They just didn't grow them like that there. And that sound was just incredible. Within two days of their return to Nashville, the success of Bye Bye Love changed the Everly Brothers' lives forever. Ed Sullivan wanted them on his show. They went on a promotional tour with Johnny Cash. Cadence Records advanced them $5,000 apiece and a new car. The peak of it all was when they were asked to appear on the Grand Ole Opry. This was it. To get past that door was my ambition. And uh, was, uh, it's still one of, the, it's a high, one of the highlights of my life. The spring and summer of 57 was a whirlwind of promotional tours and television and radio appearances. The Everly Brothers also went on their first national tour, headlined by Chuck Berry and Fats Domino. The brothers didn't fully realize it yet, but they were part of the first wave of rock and roll. Everything about them was new. Their hairstyles, their clothes, especially their never-before-heard blend of country, rockabilly, and bluegrass. We were being in an interview like this when I was 20 years old, 21 years old, was the question would be, what are you going to do when this is in, when this is over, this music that you're trying to do? What do you, do you call this music? Bye Bye Love stayed at the top of the charts for 27 weeks and sold more than a million copies. It was one of the first big crossover hits, doing equally well on the pop scene. As soon as the flurry over their first single began to settle, the brothers started reviewing material for their next record. After rejecting dozens of songs, Boodle O'Brien set out to write something specifically for the Everlys. He created a song that had spaces for another rift, guitar rift. He was smart. And uh, Donald came up with another wonderful rift. And when they played Wake Up Little Susie, somehow that song just said, whoa, that one's right. Wake up, little Susie, wake up. Wake Up Little Susie quickly surpassed the sales of Bye Bye Love. It hit number one on both the pop and country charts and sold more than two million copies. Phil and Don had proven their first hit was no fluke. With two huge crossover hits, the Everly Brothers were at the forefront of the rock and roll movement. No one other than Elvis Presley approached the enormity of their success. In a period of nine months, the brothers had gone from being broke and unemployed to having two million selling records and headlining sold out shows all over the country. Suddenly the boys had a regular paycheck, legions of fans, and the friendship of some of the biggest talents in the business. Despite the many temptations they faced, the boys stayed true to their upbringing, remaining polite, decent young men. Phil and Don enjoyed their fame, but it included a downside. We started on the road, and we stayed on the road. Just stayed on the road. It was in, for years, it seemed like. I think the record company felt you weren't, they weren't making money unless you were out there promoting it, and the AKFROs thought the same thing. I mean, and everybody tells you, it was those are the days you should be so grateful. And it's uh, not your doing. It's not your talent. It's uh, us helping you and making you into this. You know, the, the business people around you seem to me to... Uh, not give enough credit to where the music was coming from. The boys felt constant pressure to stay on top. They had always had their differences, as brothers and as musicians. But after 15 years of performing together, their differences began to surface as petty bickering. We'd be on tour and they would sort of get into a, a little 
tat. And uh, Donald will call me and say, tell Phil that uh, I'm going to wear the black bow tie with the white shirt and the gray tux. And you know, we'll, we'll call Don back and tell him I'm wearing the black tux with the white bow tie and the striped shirt, you know. And that will go back and forth. Their personal problems didn't affect their popularity. They had charm, soulful harmonies, and a sound that stood out from the rest of early rock and roll. They also had the great fortune to be linked with one of the best songwriting teams of the time, Boudelot and Felice Bryant. Boudelot loved harmonies, and uh, when we first got into the business, uh, what we wrote was, as my favorite saying was, do edible. We were made for the Everleys, and the Everleys were made for us, you know? If you talk about the Everly Brothers, I think you're also talking about the Bryants. And uh, the Bryants not only wrote wonderful songs, they wrote wonderful songs for the Everly Brothers. I think they just knew how to write to those voices, to use those voices. From 1956 through 1959, the Everleys recorded nine Bryant compositions, six of which sold more than a million records, and all of which reached the Billboard Top 40. Overall, of their first 18 singles, 13 placed well on the charts. I remember driving up from Memphis or something where in here and a couple of their first releases and it was just like echoes all over the United States and all over the world, I guess. Yeah, I was amazed that two kids from Kentucky could do that and make such great records and be popular all over the world. As their success grew, so did the tensions between the brothers. They were on the road a grueling nine months out of every year. When they were home in Nashville, they were usually in the studio, trying to come up with their next hit. They never liked recording. That was one thing that was always a war. I mean, Phil would come up with an idea he thought was great, and Donald would go, no, I, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. And then Donald would say, how about this? And Phil would go, no, and as well, let's break and have lunch, you know. When the Everly Brothers' Cadence Records contract ended in 1960, they were the most lucrative commodity around. A fledgling record company called Warner Brothers made history by signing the boys to the first ever $1 million 10-year long contract. Now they were not only the number one group in the world, but the highest paid. The Everly Brothers began 1960 having just signed an unprecedented $1 million contract with Warner Brothers. At ages 21 and 23, Phil and Don were secure. They were also under a huge amount of pressure to come up with a big hit for their new label. The money wasn't so much as just uh, being able to get a hit the first time out of the box because everybody said, ah, oh, they'll not do it this time. This, is, this will not work. And of course, we came up with the song, Kathy's Clown, thank goodness. The Everleys didn't disappoint. Kathy's Clown, written by Don, was their biggest record yet. It topped the American and British charts and sold more than two and a half million copies. Having survived the change in record labels, the Everleys began what they hoped would be the next big phase of their career. They moved to Hollywood for six months to study acting. In January 1961, they had their first big screen test. They dressed us both as cowboys, you know, like, and I was a, the good cowboy in brown, Donald was the bad cowboy in black, and we had guns, and that progressed and progressed and uh, got worse and worse, <laughs> got quieter and quieter on the set. You know, you look around like a hillbilly and, you know, out of place and out of kilter, and you don't belong there, and you know it. It don't take me long to figure out where I don't belong. And then he says, hi, partner, how are you, you know, and all that. Then he says, I'll be seeing you. And when he left, I said, not in the movies. And that made everybody laugh, you know. <laughs> but it was pr prophetic. <laughs> well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's like a 
funny story to cover up with the ignorance of management and putting us in that position. The ignorant people that we had around us. After their disastrous screen test, the Everly Brothers turned back to their music. They found little refuge there. Though they produced an occasional hit, that wasn't good enough for Warner Brothers' top paying act, who were expected to churn out one number one song after another. They virtually disappeared from the pop charts and appeared with much less frequency in the country top 40. Tensions grew between the brothers and their manager, Wesley Rose, over what material to record. Their artistic differences grew to the point that the boys considered severing their ties with Rose. Then we started to have the problems with uh, Wesley Rose, and that, that relationship was breaking down, and that finally broke totally down. And then we could no longer get any more Boodle Bryant and Felice Bryant songs, because Wesley had them under contract, and we had broken with his management team. And that is the real turning points in, in uh, our career, I think. By the end of 1961, the Everleys had to come up with their own material. Don was literally on his own when his marriage ended. There had been long separations while he was on the road, and the couple had grown in different directions. The divorce was a bitter one, as was the split with Wesley Rose. Litigation was pending in both cases. Through it all, the boys continued a hectic schedule. They were exhausted and at the advice of a colleague saw a popular but experimental physician who treated them with vitamin injections. The Marine is the greatest fighting man in the world. When Phil and Don became eligible for the draft, the idea of escaping their woes was almost attractive. In the end, they had little choice. They could either enlist for six months in the Marines or serve two years in another branch of national service. On November 25th, Don, Phil, and their bass player, Joey Page, reported for duty. The sergeant, as we were getting down to the base, he said, see those hills over there? He said, you guys are going to be going up and down those hills with 80 pounds on your back, and we're going, Ugh. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> the Marine Corps was wonderful. I mean, we came right off of the road, and there's this cloud of craziness, and went into the Marine Corps, and they did put my feet on the ground and made me strong and for the, the, some of the trials and tribulations I had after the Marine Corps, that I think that maybe the Marine Corps, the strength that uh, physically and mentally that maybe helped me through. On February 13, 1962, Don and Phil finished their basic training. That same day, Don married a British actress he met in Hollywood named Venetia Stevenson. In May, the boys were honorably discharged and immediately hit the road and the studio to get themselves back into the public eye. Though they continued to draw crowds for their live shows, their new recordings did not fare as well. To ask why the Everly Brothers sold less records, uh, you know, at a certain point in the early 60s as opposed to their initial run is sort of like asking, you know, why Coke had a better week than Pepsi. These are the vagaries of, you know, marketing and you know, what was going on in record distribution and who was getting paid off to get what record on what jukebox and to get what song on the air. Their career struggles and work schedule left both brothers on the brink of burnout. They continued treatment with the experimental physician they'd been seeing prior to entering the Marines. Initially, he'd given them vitamin injections. Now he switched to amphetamines. That doctor is of infamous he treated John Camp Kennedy, he treated uh, Tennessee Williams, he treated uh, Eddie Fisher, he treated everybody, and, he, and I wound up a patient for what I don't know. But before long, he's a guru. He's one of those guru who guru'd you with a needle. The brothers believed they were receiving legitimate treatment for exhaustion. In fact, they were both becoming addicted to amphetamines. As they grew more dependent, they became more irritable and depressed. For unknown reasons, Don's reaction was much worse. You get so stoned, you don't know what you're doing. And I was a hillbilly, young hillbilly, and I was addicted. Of course, you weren't supposed to be addicted. That's not an addictive drug that they were given. It was not addictive. You're not addicted. It's all in your head. Of course, that's wrong now. We know that for sure. And I remember getting to the point that I didn't want to live. I mean, it just, just, just get me out. Get me out, you know. 
On October 14, 1962, just a few hours before the Everly Brothers were scheduled to go on stage in London, Don was nowhere to be found. Phil got a phone call with horrific news. Don attempted suicide with a drug overdose. It just, you know, it's like an explosion. You know, sad. I mean, more sad is just heartbreaking. You know, I didn't know if he was going to live or die. You know, who knows? You just don't know. Two days later, Don was flown to a New York hospital. Fans around the world wondered if he would be all right. After years of treatment, he would. But the Everly Brothers would never be the same. Dream. From 1957 through 1962, the Everly Brothers sold more than 35 million records and had 26 singles make the Billboard charts. This phenomenal success was part of a frantic and perilous journey that nearly cost Don his life. Just a few months after his drug overdose, the boys were forced to go back to work. Back on the tour to, to pay the bills, that was the whole deal. You know, and then while we were out on the road nine months a year, the 60s happened, you know, and we didn't ever spend any time in the studio again. It was meaningful. While the Everleys were trying to get back on their feet, the Beatles were taking the world by storm. We were coming back to England, and the press had quit showing up in the, at the airport like they had in the beginning. And we came back to England in about 63 or 64, right before the Beatles hit here. And we looked, and we was coming off the plane, and there was the press. We said, geez, it must be, have a hit or something. And the only thing they held it, what do you think of the Beatles? <laughs> the, the, you know, the grand irony was that the Beatles were certainly early on basically doing the Everly Brothers. As American audiences surrendered to the British invasion, they turned their backs on their former favored sons, including the Everleys. They disappeared from the charts, and even their stalwart faithful began turning out in lesser numbers for their road shows. For the first time since their early days in Nashville, the Everly Brothers faced rejection. It was still from one hit to the next. People were just saying, oh, that one didn't make it, did it? It was the material, it was uh, everything. And it's hard to maintain that level of uh, popularity. Nobody does it. What it is is you wind up touring more, and you wound up uh, playing uh, less desirable places and making less money. So, which meant more touring and less desirable places. It's sort of a spiral down. It's not like things pick up, but you still have the responsibilities of families and children, or you're divorced and you have lawyer fees and you have accountants and you have, you've created this uh, masterfully complicated life for yourself and, and you have to support it. For nearly 30 years, Phil and Don had been performing together. For much of that time, their differences simmered below the surface, erupting into an occasional argument. Now, a lifetime of sibling rivalry began to wear thin. We'd be in some town and someone would go, let Phil sing a song, and Donald would just, he's the harmony singer, I'm the lead singer, you know. And so there was always that little rub existing. I don't know, you know. Just changing times, changing brothers. Um, the, uh, I mean, it's, it's an uncommon thing for brothers to be singing together. Anyhow, I don't, there's not too many that have managed it and without some kind of glitches. And we are about as average as anybody else when it comes to that. The tensions between Phil and Don were growing. The brothers felt trapped in an unusually close relationship, one begun in early childhood when they started performing together. It didn't help that the media often confused their identities, sometimes even mistaking them for twins. People didn't really give them the full credit for being individual artists in their own right. So that's a tension right there. There's a tension of, do we go the nostalgia route 
uh, do we become a Vegas act, or do we try to, uh, you know, force our way into the rock world that is really not embracing us? Finally, the brothers agreed that they needed to take a break from one another. They decided their last concert would be in Southern California on July 14, 1973. Word spread that it was to be their last performance. Some fans traveled hundreds of miles to see the show. Instead of seeing a joyous celebration of an incredible career, what thousands of fans saw was a lifetime of pent-up emotion explode. The show was not going. They were skipping songs, and it was, it was just, as a little kid, you just kind of realized, well, something's wrong, something's different, and, and Dad didn't seem himself, and nothing seemed right. The entire band had a few drinks before the show. Instead of relaxing them as they had hoped, the liquor pushed their already fragile emotions over the edge. The brothers were unable and unwilling to continue the concert. And then all of a sudden, they just kind of stormed off, and I remember driving home with Dad, and, and he was just mad and angry and upset about something, but I didn't have any, remotely any comprehension as to what it meant. Well, we just didn't have, it was, it was anything happening. I mean, it was literally, uh, it wasn't what I wanted out of life. I wanted, you know, I just didn't want it anymore. After three decades of singing together, the Everly Brothers were finished. Years of pressure, frustration, and resentment ended the brothers' professional and personal relationship. For 10 years, they would not speak to one another. Very sad, you know. It was uh, at the end of something, you know, like the Beatles, you know, something really big, that's something that really meant something, and you thought, boy, could this be it? And we're not going to hear this anymore, you know. Their breakup is still a sore subject today, something they choose not to discuss. At the time, they agreed to take a much-needed break. In 10 years, the only occasion they met was at their father's funeral in 1975. Their time away from one another was strangely parallel. They both went through marriages, had children, and took life at a much slower pace. Our father spent those 10 years raising us, you know, and spending time with family, which is something really important to him, and took time in his life to figure things out and grow. Throughout the 70s, both Phil and Don pursued solo careers. Don moved back to Nashville, where he explored his country roots. I had a group called the Dead Cowboys, which I still have, which I love, which is something where I get to be just Don on uh, singing, playing, whatever. Phil stayed in Los Angeles. In 1975, Linda Ronstadt's version of his composition, When Will I Be Loved, became one of the biggest country hits ever. Though their solo careers were personally gratifying, they were never embraced by the public, who continued to mourn the loss of the Everly Brothers. I think people always felt when they saw a Phil record or a Don record, before they, you know, bought it, they were being ripped off because they were getting, uh, you know, it was being, uh, it was half of something. It wasn't, uh, but that's the way it gets perceived. Uh, Dad said something to me. He said, you know, boys, he said, you know, you'll never be as big as you were together, you know. And um, I'd really understood what Dad was saying when he was saying that. And that was the truth. I knew that the duet was the cards that I was going to play in life, you know. I knew that. In time, both brothers would come to the same conclusion. The enormity of what they were as the Everly brothers dwarfed the forces that drove them apart. Their destiny was to perform together, and their destiny was calling. 1983 marked a decade that the Everly brothers had been apart. Now 46 and 44 years old, both brothers had experienced several marriages and divorces fathered children and become a bit older and a bit wiser. Ten years went by and you change in ten years, a nice decade would go by and things are real different, look different to you, forget what you're angry about maybe and what bothers you and the life's different and everything's different. And one day I remember going over to Phil's house and he goes, Donald called me. And I said, you're kidding. And he said, no, he said he called me and, you know, it sounds like he wants to get back together again. Phil and Don chose London's Royal Albert Hall as the site for their reunion concert. On September 22, 1983, 7,000 fans in attendance and millions more around the world celebrated the return of the Everly Brothers. They entered from uh, either side of the stage and just uh, met in the middle of the stage and just uh, uh, the crowd went crazy. You know, and it was, uh, 
It's hard to describe really what, what it was like to be there at that moment. You know? It was magical. It was really warm and whether or not it's true, it, you almost sense they liked one another that night. It's good to be back. It was an extraordinary evening. And I think it was the best thing that, uh, you know, you, you could say, well, we had all that 10 years apart, and then it led up to this wonderful evening. It was really kind of fun, you know? Kind of nice in that way. The reunion concert was an overwhelming success. A live album was recorded for the millions of fans who couldn't be there. The enthusiastic response encouraged the brothers to pursue a second career. Since 1983, they've toured together every year. Their honors include being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, getting a star on the Hollywood Boulevard Walk of Fame, and receiving a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. Amidst all the fame, they continue to celebrate their roots, returning every year to Muhlenberg County, Kentucky, where they've established a scholarship fund. Don and Phil, we didn't prepare any major speech. We just want to tell you, we love you guys to death. I'm proud of being from Kentucky. I'm proud of the people in Kentucky. I like the people in Kentucky. We have a lot there in Kentucky. Kentucky is your inner roots, you know, like where you're really from and who you're really connected to. So it's really a kind of home, and no matter how far you roam, you know, you can just go back there, and you're at home, and it's just really good. A little older and a little wiser, Phil and Don now enjoy their time touring together, at their own pace and on their own terms. Don and Phil are brothers first, and blood is very important. Everything else is secondary when you think about it's your brother. And they do have peace with themselves. They have peace with one another. They agree to disagree. I'm happily married now, and all, but all the things I really want in life, I've got. I have, you know, my health, and I have a wonderful wife, and a family now, and it's really good. I have two sons, and, and uh, both of them musicians. They're both good boys, and we have a guitar string company. And we make manufacture strings. They also run that for me. We have something that uh, family business now that we're all involved in, and that's really good fixing to get uh, married again. I have a, a young lady named uh, Patty that um, we're gonna get married. The Everly Brothers music continues to resonate today. A 1998 musical version of their life story was performed at the Ryman Auditorium, a place near to their heart, where they performed at the very beginning of their fame. More than 40 years after their first release, the Everly Brothers still thrill audiences inspire countless musicians and maintain one of the highest standards in all of music. The Everly Brothers didn't have to come back to have earned their place in rock history. They earned it, you know, right at the beginning. They basically passed the baton uh, to the Beatles, who passed the baton to everybody else. We can get out there and sing. That's what we can do together. I don't think we have to do anything else together to prove anything to anybody. We're just our people. But we were, I think, destined to do what we're doing, and we wound up doing it anyway, whether there is a destiny or not. Web's best bios. Log on to our website at biography.com.